The map itself completely debunks the mainstream explanation for how the ancient Egyptians were able to construct the Great Pyramid of Giza and how long it took them to do so. And in this video, I'm going to share with you a few short video clips of the most common methods described by mainstream archaeologists, Egyptologists, and academics for how the ancient Egyptians were able to cut and carve these stones. So you can see firsthand with your own eyes just how flawed these methods truly are. Now, depending on what source you look at, the time frames vary on how long it took the ancient Egyptians to construct the Great Pyramid of Giza, ranging from 10 to 30 years. However, 20 years is the most commonly accepted time frame. It's what they teach in school. 20 years to cut, carve, move, and perfectly place approximately 2.5 million stone blocks. That's equivalent to one block every two minutes and six seconds. The precision of these 2.5 million stone blocks is incredible. Not even a razor or a pin needle can fit between them. And just to remind ourselves, each block has six sides. I don't mean to be patronizing, but just as a visual reminder that each block would have had to been perfect on all six sides. And although the size of these stone blocks did vary, the average size was 50 inches by 50 inches by 27, and you can see here the metric conversion on the screen. But this, of course, does not include some of the blocks that are absolutely massive. To give us a better appreciation of the massive scale of the Great Pyramid, it's more than 755 feet long at its base and is made up of more than 200 layers. And each layer had to be absolutely perfect. Each block had to be laid down and placed down to a fraction of a millimeter. Otherwise, the entire pyramid would not have been nearly as precise as it is. Out of these 2.5 million stone blocks, a significant majority of them are made up of limestone. And one of the most common methods described by Egyptologists is that the Egyptians used stone hammers and bronze chisels to cut and carve these stones. And real quick, if you're not familiar, bronze is a makeup of copper and tin. Let me jump into the first video clip, which includes Mark Lehner, one of the most leading authorities on Egyptology and the works of the pyramids and the Sphinx. And you'll find his name cited in almost every single textbook throughout the world regarding these subjects. In this video, you'll see that they tried and cut and carve one limestone block down to half the size of the Great Sphinx's nose. And real quick, you'll see some subcaptions in this video. Those are not my words, that's from the person that uploaded this. And I'll include the link to that seven minute video in the description. However, I edited it down to show just the highlights and this clip is about 55 seconds long. Here we go. But even with reinforcements and after hours of pounding, they barely made a dent. After days of work, their copper chisels and stone pounders are barely making a dent. Brown is wearing down tools at an extraordinary rate. The copper chisel the ancient Egyptians would have used lasts only a few dozen strikes. The heating pounding cycle is repeated over and over. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Until the shape is just right. They must have amassed more copper for building the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx than just about any place in the world in the third millennium BC. I mean, it just must have been a huge cost in copper. Wow, so just a few dozen strikes per chisel? And then you saw how long it takes them to reshape this thing? I mean, heating it and cooling it several times? An incredibly lengthy period of time. And you heard Mark Lehner himself discuss how the Egyptians would have had a massive amount of copper chisels which hasn't been found, and I'll touch on that point later in this video. And by the way, they didn't even finish this project. They brought in power tools, and it took professionals more than two weeks to cut and carve this nose. Now, like I mentioned, a significant majority of the Great Pyramid is made up of limestone blocks. However, the internal structure is made up of granite. This includes the internal passageways, the massive Grand Gallery, the Queen's Chamber, as well as the King's Chamber itself. And these blocks, many of them, are more than 70 tons and seemingly have laser-cut precision. So here's a quick 20-second clip on using bronze chisels on granite, which is significantly stronger than limestone. When Roger tries chisels made from bronze, the results are disappointing. As you can see, we're just we're leaving a lot of metal and very little stone is flaking off. So regardless of whether we're talking limestone or granite, the bronze chisel stone hammer theory is debunked. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute based on the time and the precision. So this brings me back to the question on where are all the bronze chisels now? 
Why have they found so few? I'm trying to find a specific number, but have they found even more than a few dozen of these things throughout the entire country of Egypt? I mean, if anyone has a specific number, please share. I've been trying to research this for myself. But clearly, they would have had to have had hundreds of thousands of these tools. I mean, two dozen strikes per chisel, and it takes much longer than most people realize to reshape it. I think the most logical explanation of why they're not finding so many bronze chisels is the fact they just weren't using these as the primary method to cut and carve tens of millions of stone blocks. This brings me on to a more common and popular theory, which is utilizing copper and bronze saws to cut through these stones. And as you can see here, these are clip art images provided by Egyptologists on the theory of using copper saws to cut through stone. So let me show you the next video clip that shows them trying to utilize copper saws on granite. All right, we have a big block of granite here. So how's this copper going to cut this granite? Even with teeth, the copper alone is too soft. We're going to put sand inside the groove and we're going to put this saw on top of the sand and then let the sand do the cutting. Now, Dennis, will we see any progress in our lifetime? Yes, um, if you came back in an hour's time, you would see about a four millimeter cut down into the stone. You're kidding, in an hour you'll be four millimeters down? Well, I've been doing a lot of experiments and I can guarantee that this will cut through the stone at about four millimeters an hour. The sign went wonderful once we switched over to using uh, water with the sand. As you can see here, we achieved this in just a few days. Four millimeters an hour. That's equivalent to about one-sixth of one inch. And although they said it went much quicker while using water, they didn't specify how much quicker. I mean, was it twice as fast? Was it even that much? Let's just assume that it was six times as fast, so one inch an hour. That still doesn't compute whatsoever. And this doesn't include the fact that they've never found a copper saw of this size anywhere throughout ancient Egypt. In fact, you won't even find any depictions of it through wall paintings, hieroglyphs, petroglyphs, nowhere. In fact, the only art that you'll find is just a few different images where they have these smaller copper saws and they utilize them to cut wood. And as you can see here, here's the best example I could find of a copper saw. And look at that, that's not even a two foot blade. Is that even 18 inches, maybe 20 inches altogether? And we're supposed to believe that these small saws, and I'll show you more examples of them in just a moment, were used to cut and carve even an average size block? I mean, never mind the much larger stone blocks found throughout the Pyramid of Giza. But again, that video was showing you cutting through granite. So let me show you a different video clip of people using hand saws to cut through limestone blocks. And although this video has nothing to do with Egyptology whatsoever, these are just some old school guys that show you that you can use hand saws to cut through limestone. Well, here's the video clip. So a couple notable points right off the bat is, did you see how long those saws were? They must have been longer than five feet. Not to mention, they were not made up of copper whatsoever. And also take a look at the aggressive cross-cut teeth that these saws had. Clearly, the ancient Egyptians had nothing like this. There's not one single bit of evidence to suggest it. And it's worth mentioning that the finished product isn't perfect at all. I mean, yeah, there are some very straight lines, but when you look at the block as a whole, it's just not perfect. So they would have had to gone back over it with what? bronze chisels again? Another point worth mentioning is how difficult the sawing becomes when you get down to the base of the block. I mean, take for example the limestone quarry located right there on the Giza Plateau. Imagine with, I mean, that's right on bedrock. Look how little room you have to work with. How could you cut the base of that stone block? And not to mention, as you see here, these other examples of these bronze saws found throughout ancient Egypt, I mean, they're incredibly short. None of them exceed two feet long. And I'm under the impression, I mean, have they even found a dozen of these things ever? Does anyone have an estimate? These are all the examples I could find pictures of, but it really raises a lot of questions. Clearly this method just does not compute, and not to mention the complete lack of evidence to support it. Are we supposed to believe that this would have been a method utilized to be able to cut, carve, move in place perfectly one block every two minutes and six seconds? Guys, it doesn't add up. 
Let me transition into another example, which is utilizing wood wedges that are soaked in water in order to split apart massive stone blocks. And there is evidence of this. As you can see here, these are examples from the Aswan Quarry, which is about 500 miles from the Great Pyramids. First, it must be mentioned that the soaked wood would not provide nearly as precise cut as using chisels. So in modern times, you can see people doing it here in these examples, these photos. But the end product does not justify the incredible precision of the stone blocks at the Great Pyramid of Giza. Are we supposed to believe that they would have gone back over that stone block with bronze chisels and copper saws all over again when we've already seen that those methods don't work anyhow? And not to mention a complete lack of evidence on the Giza Plateau to support that this is the method that they were utilizing. Yes, the ancient Egyptians did do this. We have evidence at the Aswan Quarry again, but nothing to justify two and a half million stone blocks. Not at all. And we have to remind ourselves that we're only discussing the Great Pyramid of Giza. There are between 118 and 138 pyramids scattered throughout Egypt. And in fact, this isn't even updated because as I mentioned in other videos, just earlier this year, they found an entirely new pyramid in ruins under the sands of Egypt, which again raises all kinds of questions. But for hundreds of pyramids, we're talking tens of millions of stone blocks. And if they can't compute these or finish or construct one pyramid in the 20, 30 year time frame, it completely debunks the entire narrative. Now, I certainly don't think that everything is a conspiracy or a cover-up, but we have to start asking serious questions when the leading authorities on the topic of Egyptology, whose works are published in textbooks all over the world regarding the pyramids and the Sphinx, and these individuals have seen firsthand with their own eyes that none of these methods compute, and yet they've done nothing to bring this up or raise the question of developing new theories and asking new questions instead they keep pushing the same narrative. They're teaching this in school right now. They're handing out PhDs with these methods and nobody seems to be thinking for themselves to just try them. And to make this even more disturbing, this same guy, Mark Lehner, seems to be going along with this 10 year time frame. He's doubling down. Instead of acknowledging that these methods don't work, he's going along with a possible 10 year time frame that's been discussed by other Egyptologists. What is going on? It's time we start asking serious questions about it, but I'll leave it at that. Leave me a comment, let me know what your thoughts are, but like and subscribe, I'm Jimmy, this is Bright Insight. Many more videos to come on a whole wide variety of topics. Take care, everybody.